Hope your work week is off to a good start. This is the Daily Report for February 14th here in Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. COVID-19 self-test kits can only be bought offline as of this past Sunday to ensure productive distribution. We have details on that after a check on the global pandemic update. I have Kwon Soa standing by. So welcome back. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, so what do you have for us on this Monday? Well, Sunny, we, Korea is continuing its streak of more than 50,000 daily infections this Monday as the new work week starts off with over 54,600 new infections that were counted as of 12 a.m. And that includes more than 54,500 domestic transmissions and 106 cases from abroad. Now, following record highs over the weekend, uh, with cases even surging to above 56,000, now the average in daily infections in the past seven days stands at above 50,000. And if we go over to our map, uh, you can see that the capital is Hoi, Gyeonggi-do province, uh, both way above 10,000 infections. And uh, Daegu, meanwhile, has hit the 60,000 mark in its total caseload this Monday with over 2,000 cases. Uh, and also you see that uh, most of the places are now seeing more than four, at least four digit figures of daily cases. And uh, Korea also has accumulated now one 1.4 million infections and over 7,100 fatalities with 21 people having lost their lives due to this virus in the past day. Moving over to uh, the number of patients in severe or critical condition after this number has been in the 200s for quite some time now for the first time in 17 days this number has hit above 300. And uh, moving over to uh, vaccination figures now 87.2 percent and 86.2 percent of the nation's population have either received their first or second COVID-19 vaccine shot and 57.3 percent or roughly 29.4 million people have gotten their additional shot. And uh, now let's take a look at the global figures. It appears that there's been a slight decline in infections, although we do have the weekend factor. Uh, a little less than 1.5 million new cases were tallied in the past 24 hours as of noon Korea time and a little over 5,500 COVID-19 related fatalities. Now Russia has hit 14 million cases in the past day and Germany has surpassed the total caseload of Italy and we also see Japan now here on this table which has now the 19th highest number of cases in the world. And those are the general updates I have for now but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny. All right, so thank you for those global tallies. Here in Korea, as mentioned earlier, self-test kits for COVID-19 have been restricted to offline stores. For more, Shin Yeon joins me now. Yeon, it's been a while. Welcome back. Thanks for having me, Sunny. Right, so let's begin with the various restrictions on the selling and buying of these rapid antigen test kits. Right, so from Sunday, the government banned online sales of these test kits to prevent scalping at marked up prices. In consideration of surplus inventory, though, there will be a grace period up to the 16th, meaning that technically people can still buy test kits online until Wednesday. And authorities introduced the measure to prevent a small group of individuals from hoarding all the supply. Officials have also limited the number of kits one can buy offline, for instance, at pharmacies and convenience stores to only five kits per person. Now, there won't be any restrictions preventing people who choose to buy more than five by visiting, visiting multiple locations. Notwithstanding this latest measure kicking off from Sunday, many said the test kits were selling like hotcakes. Take a listen to what one pharmacist had to say. I was receiving calls all day on how many kits are left. Today I have 200 ready in stock, but by 1 or 2 p.m. they'll all be sold out. Right. I understand EA and authorities are also looking to look at other options, that is, of ensuring adequate supplies of these test kits. That's right. Authorities are expanding the number of kits to be distributed to pharmacies and convenience stores nationwide. Starting Monday until February 28th, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety will distribute a total of 30 million test kits nationwide. And during the same period, an extra 24 million kits will be supplied to testing sites and for individuals at high risk, like those in senior care centers. And this will be free of charge. In March, the country plans to supply a total of 190 million self test kits, which is actually double the amount projected for February. And this comes as Prime Minister Kim Bugyeom reportedly held a meeting with representatives of rapid antigen test kit manufacturers on Sunday. And this includes 
meets the CEOs of SD Biosensor and GenBody. The Prime Minister asked the firms to expand production as these kits are a key part of the country's latest containment strategy. Right. Now, Yeo, you mentioned that these test kits will be provided free of charge to those at high risk. Tell us more about that. Right. So they'll be provided to those in senior care centers and students and staff at preschools all the way up to high schools can receive these self-test kits for free. And the Education Ministry on Monday said they would provide kits to some 6.9 million students and teachers ahead of the new semester in March. Beginning on the 21st, rapid antigen kits will first be given out to uh, kindergartners and elementary school students. And there will be enough for each student to get tested twice a week for a total of five weeks. In regards to how many kits a teacher or student in middle and high school will receive, well, that number has not yet been decided. Now, in in order for the education minister to push forward with this plan, the government has to secure more than 58 million kits, and this would cost them over 141 billion won, which is around 118 million U.S. dollars. And the ministry has currently applied for national subsidies, which must be cleared by the National Assembly. And authorities will also release detailed guidelines on just how exactly many times one needs to be tested before going to school this Wednesday. Right. Now, yeah, and I understand authorities have also addressed public concerns over potential repercussions resulting from our recent changes to the to our containment strategy, right? That's right. Regarding the latest revisions, a top health official on Monday asked for a little more patience from the public. Take a listen to what he had to say. We've seen a delay in transitioning to our latest COVID-19 strategy amid the spread of Omicron. Because of that, many have been confused and raised concerns. We ask for your deep understanding. Accordingly, authorities said they would also extend local tax deadlines by up to one year to lessen the financial burden of the pandemic on ordinary citizens. They also said more subsidies will be provided to households with the COVID-19 patient receiving at-home treatment and paid leave will also be provided to workers who have been ordered to self-isolate. On the vaccination front, Ian, what's the latest with regard to our rollout of Novavax? Well, Novavax is the fifth vaccine to be authorized here in Korea, and the vaccine is said to be administered to those over 18 years old who haven't been vaccinated or who haven't had the booster shot due to side effects. Also, authorities are set on administering fourth doses of the COVID-19 vaccine to those with weak immune systems and residents at senior care facilities. The fourth shot, also known as the second booster, can be received four months after the third shot, which means they could roll out as early as the end of this month. All right, Yeo, and as always then, thank you for the local update. See you on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Right, up next, I have Soa back at the desk with a more detailed coverage of the Omicron situation elsewhere. Soa, let's begin here in Asia then. Yes, Sonny, and let's start with Hong Kong, where potentially more than 3,000 people have contracted COVID-19 in just a day. As on Sunday, health officials said that 1,347 new infections have been confirmed, but with more than 2,000 preliminary positive cases in addition. It marked the third straight day that the city posted over 1,000 infections. While Hong Kong had implemented its toughest ever social distancing measures last Last week, closing non-essential businesses and tightening its vaccine verification system, it is mulling over loosening hospitalization rules amid the rising figures. As so far, all COVID-19 patients were required to be treated at hospitals regardless of the severity of their symptoms. At the Beijing Winter Olympics, three new coronavirus cases were confirmed by the IOC on Sunday among games-related personnel. Two cases were detected at the airport and one among the so-called Olympic bubble. Japan may have hit its peak of the country's sixth wave as some 77,000 new cases were tallied on Sunday evening, which was a rise from the day before. However, an on-week decline from more than 90,000 infections last Sunday. Also, the weekly average of daily cases has gone down slightly, marking the first such drop since the Omicron variant hit Japan earlier this year. 
Right, so what about other countries that witness record cases? Well, Sunny, in terms of record cases, we've got New Zealand, which has posted 981 cases on Monday. And uh, in general, however, there has been also some positive developments. According to IP, uh, UPI, that is, COVID-19 cases worldwide are on the decline in the past week, dropping by around 19 percent, while deaths have declined by around 1 percent. And uh, it also mentioned that Russia, Germany, Netherlands and uh, South Korea uh, were some of the countries that have set record highs in the past week. And uh, I also want to mention that South Korea now has the, the 46th highest number of cases in the world. Right. And over in Canada, so what's the latest with regard to the trucker protest there? Well, there, is, uh, there was some progress from authorities in uh, clearing protesters and uh, vehicles that have been blocking a key trade route on the border with the U.S. in the weeks-long uh, demonstrations that have been triggered by truckers opposed to vaccine rules. Any unlawful activity in the area will not be tolerated and officers will take the necessary action to keep the peace and traffic flowing. There will be criminal consequences for those who interfere with or interrupt traffic flow. And uh, there have been some criminal consequences. Uh, the chief said 25 to 30 people have been arrested. Five vehicles were seized on Sunday and seven were towed the day before. The Ambassador Bridge in Ontario, which connects Windsor and the U.S. cities Detroit and Michigan, as of Sunday afternoon, was not yet open to traffic. It has been threatening both Canadian and U.S. economies since last Monday when truckers calling themselves the Freedom Convoy have have been blocking the bridge. Small and uh, big rallies against vaccines and masks occurred in the U.S. over the weekend too, just like this one outside the Super Bowl event. They're, um, they're sick of it in Canada. We're sick of it here and nobody wants to say it. So we're here to help people have courage to say no. Right, and staying with protests, so I hear some have chosen to express their frustrations in a more engaging manner, if I may. Yes, uh, that's how we could express this. Uh, although demonstrations against government prevention rules in some cases can turn out violent in cases. There are also some means of expressing frustration like singing and dancing. In Greece, thousands of unvaccinated healthcare workers marched through the capital Athens on a Sunday and chose to dance in front of parliament, calling on the government to let them return to work without having to get inoculated. The Greek government had suspended healthcare workers that had not received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose as part of a mandatory vaccine policy back in September. The demonstrators claimed it is unfair that their vaccinated counterparts are allowed to work while they are transmitting the virus too, especially amid the Omicron wave. In New Zealand, demonstrators in front of the Parliament House on Sunday ended up singing and dancing to Baby Shark and other songs that had been blasted through loudspeakers by the government to actually disperse the crowd. Right, I see. So, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. See you on Tuesday. See you tomorrow. Leaders of the U.S. and Ukraine have vowed to work together against a possible Russian assault on the latter. Pledges to this end were exchanged in a telephone conversation this past Sunday. Kim Hyo-san reports. President Biden spoke at length with his Ukrainian counterpart on Sunday about the ongoing tensions with Russia, with the pair agreeing on the need to pursue diplomacy and deterrence. The White House says Biden made it clear that Washington will respond swiftly and decisively against any further Russian aggression against Ukraine. He also stressed the U.S. will act collectively with its allies and partners. Their call, which lasted about 50 minutes, came just a day after President Biden's one-hour call with Russian President Vladimir Putin, during which the two leaders failed to produce a breakthrough. As Russia intensifies pressure on Ukraine, White House National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan said Sunday, that Moscow's latest ramping up of forces along the Ukrainian border 
indicates that an order for military action could come at any time. During a televised interview, he also insisted there had been a dramatic acceleration in the buildup of Russian forces over the past 10 days. Against such a backdrop, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is flying to Ukraine and Russia in an effort to de-escalate tensions. Ahead of his visit, Scholz renewed his warning to Russia and underscored the need for continued diplomacy. While pundits say Germany is not expected to make any promises on arms delivery to Ukraine, Scholz could offer further financial assistance, which Kiev has been requesting. Germany has been one of Ukraine's largest donors in recent years, providing around 2.3 billion U.S. dollars to try and stabilize the country's economy. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Meanwhile, on the sidelines of trilateral talks with their U.S. counterpart, top diplomats from Seoul and Tokyo met in Hawaii this past weekend, only to reaffirm the differences over historical matters. Our Yoon Jung-min explains. Historical disputes between Seoul and Tokyo look likely to continue against what is seen by Korea as Japan's whitewashing of the past. Reports confirmed on Monday that Japan is pushing to get the gold and silver mines on the Japanese island of Sado listed as the World Heritage for 2023, but only reflecting the period from the 16th to mid-19th century and excluding the period of the Japanese occupation of Korea and the wartime period going up to the 1940s. At least a thousand Koreans were subjected to forced labor in the mines by Japan during World War II. But it's highly likely that those facts were left out from Japan's recommendation of the mines to UNESCO. There have been calls for the broader context and history of the sites to be reflected. The issue was discussed by diplomats from the two neighbors over the weekend. South Korea's foreign minister Chong Lu-yong met his Japanese counterpart Yoshimasa Hayashi in Hawaii before a trilateral meeting with the U.S. There, Chong expressed strong regret over Japan's UNESCO push for Sado mines, but Hayashi reportedly protested. Seoul has been calling Tokyo to first fulfill its promise to honor Korean victims at other places that have been designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. In 2015, Japan's Meiji-era industrial sites, including Hashima Island, where Koreans were forcibly taken to work in coal mines, were designated as World Heritage Sites following Japan's promise to acknowledge its use of forced labor and honor the victims. However, the Industrial Heritage Information Center in Tokyo displays documents aimed at showing that Koreans were not discriminated against and it fails to honor the victims of forced labor. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. On the local political front, prospects of a merger are looking likely between the two conservative contenders of the presidential race. Our Lee kyung -un has details. The much-discussed possible conservative bloc merger has been publicly acknowledged as being on the negotiating table. In an emergency briefing on Sunday, People's Party's An Chol Su highlighted the need for a strategic alliance in order to achieve the people's demand for a change of government. To do so, he proposed unifying candidacy with the main opposition People Power Party's Yoon Song Yeol, whereby the two candidates decide on an ultimate runner in a public opinion poll. If we let the public decide who is most suitable to lead for the future, the primary shouldn't be complicated or take long. Ahn had initially ruled out the possibility of a merger but shifted his stance just 24 days ahead of Election Day. The People Power Party largely welcomed the idea of a merger itself but raised concerns over the proposed method, saying that holding an opinion poll may trigger division among the opposition bloc, which could be an advantage for the ruling Democratic Party rival Lee Jae-myung. Yoon echoed the party's sentiment. I positively review the proposal. I will think about the proposed public opinion poll, but it does leave me some sense of regret. In fact, the party's chairman Lee jun suk explicitly ruled out a primary as an option, citing Yoon leading on in the polls by a large margin. Instead, he called on An to voluntarily pull out of the running. With the two sides at odds over how to move forward, any actual merger could take some time. The best scenario will be to come to an agreement before the 28th, when ballots are printed so that the changes could be reflected on paper. 
Closely watching developments is the DP's Lee Jae-myung over the potential impact of the conservative merger on the current neck-and-neck -neck race between Lee and Yoon. Lee did not directly address the merger but instead suggested his own plan. In an emergency briefing on Monday, he called on members of the public and politicians to form a special committee in support of a unified national government. Young Eun, Arirang News. On the export front, overseas sales of Korea's ICT products maintained their growth last month. Om Jiang has more on the latest data. South Korea's tech exports last month hit a record figure for the month of January. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy released a report on Monday showing that the country's ICT exports rose by more than 20 percent on year in January to nearly 19.7 billion U.S. dollars. The export figures showed double-digit on-year growth for the 10th consecutive month. Last month's surge was mainly on the back of solid outbound shipments of semiconductors, one of the country's key export items. Rising on-year for the 19th straight month, exports of semiconductors stood at around $11 billion last month. This is a jump of more than 24 percent compared to the same period in the year before, and the figure has exceeded the $10 billion mark for nine months in a row. Exports of both memory and system chips were up as the pandemic continued to spur demand, especially from data centers. Shipments of displays also increased by around 13 percent in January, compared to the same period in the previous year, recording around $2.4 billion, with OLED displays performing particularly well. Computers and related equipment also jumped by more than 54 percent, reaching more than $1.5 billion. However, exports of mobile phones dropped by around 13 percent last month as new models were expected in February. ICT exports to the five major countries have all risen on year, with exports to China increasing by around 24 percent and to the U.S. by about 9 percent. Om Ji-yong, Arirang News. Over in Beijing, Korea garnered a silver in the women's short track relay Sunday night at the Winter Games. Our Kim Bo Gyeong has the highlights. The four women in South Korea's short track relay team had what it took Sunday to win the silver medal in the 3,000 meter event. Choi Min Jung, Kim Arang, Lee Yoo Bin, and Seo Hui Min finished second after a big comeback, crossing the line in a time of 4 minutes 3.63 seconds. The race had viewers on the edge of their seats as the quartet started in last position and remained at the back of the pack for the majority of the race. It was not until the final three laps of the 27-lap race that Kim Arang powered through to third-place racing past China, with Choi min -jung keeping up the momentum and eventually sealing second for South Korea. The South Korean women's team has won medals in three consecutive Olympics, gold in Sochi in 2014, and gold four years later in Pyeongchang. Che, Kim, and Lee were members of the gold medal-winning team in Pyeongchang. In Beijing, Shim seok -ki was replaced by Seo Hui min due to her off-ice issues. The team from the Netherlands, led by star skater Suzanne Schulting, won the gold in Sunday's relay. China had to settle for bronze. President Moon Jae-in sent a congratulatory message to the South Korean quartet, saying he was grateful they showed the value of going together, while applauding their efforts and encouraging them for their remaining races. Also on the ice, 1,500-meter Olympic gold medalist Hwang dae hon was in the running for his second medal in Beijing on Sunday, but he was disqualified in the semifinals of the men's 500-meter race. Hwang was penalized for an illegal late pass causing contact, as he tried to move forward from fourth only to hit a Canadian skater before skidding into the padded wall. However, Hwang still has a chance to bring home another medal as he will represent South Korea in the final of the men's 5,000-meter relay final on Wednesday. Kim bo -kyung, Arirang News.
Authorities here in the country have indeed taken action to ensure proper distribution of COVID-19 self-test kits amid surging public demand as Omicron drives an explosive surge in case counts. Do take a look. At-home COVID-19 testing kits have now become the most sought-after commodities at pharmacies nationwide. But limited supplies mean that shipments are spread thin, and they're often sold out in a matter of minutes. The demand for self-test kits have gone through the roof here in Korea. Self-test kits have become one of the most popular keywords searched in online shopping malls. Also, the quantities of at-home test kits sold at convenience stores jumped more than tenfold in a one-week span, from late January to early February. This has begged the question, are we producing enough test kits here at home to keep pace with rising demand? This is a self-test kit manufacturer located south of Seoul, which has been operating on a 24-hour schedule since January. The firm is now prioritizing domestic shipments over exports for the time being, due to the surging number of COVID-19 cases in Korea and a shift in the country's testing strategy. 초창기 때는 그한 100만 개 정도 했는데 지금 한 170만 개까지 올라간 것 같아요. 계속 늘려 나가고 있고 이제 우리 캐파가 전체적으로 이제 일 300만 개인데 어 거기에 곧 도달 도달할 거고 그 다음에 지금 더 확충을 하고 있어요. 그래서 3월 달 정도 되면 한달 동안 1억 7천만 개 정도 생산이 가능할 것 같습니다. Test kit shortages are becoming a source of growing concern for the Korean public. But experts say that these worries can be set aside due to the availability of free testing at the many screening centers that are operating across the country. Mask is a kind of mandatory for every day, but kit, we don't need the purchasing to in advance. So if you have a symptom, please visit a temporary or the screening center for the COVID-19 and the Yes, you can wait for nearly an hour because now jamming to the people, but you can get it in free. Don't feel afraid about the shortage, but don't need the buying purchase in advance, please. Nevertheless, the Korean government has intervened to ensure a steady supply of at-home test kits in the market, allowing the public to put their concerns to rest. With the government's latest approval of two additional rapid antigen testing devices on February 4th, a total of five local firms have now been authorized by Korea's drug regulator to supply at-home test kits to the market. The government is also considering a price cap on home test kits to prevent overinflated markups. Test kits will also be provided free of charge to high-risk locations like daycare centers and nursing homes starting on February 21st. 정부는 가격 교란 행위를 원천적으로 차단하고 시장을 안정화시키기 위해서 2월 13일부터 온라인 판매를 금지하고 판매처를 약국과 편의점 등으로 한정했습니다. 또한 매점 매석, 폭리 등 불공정 행위를 차단하기 위해서 1회 구입 수량을 제한하는 등 유통 개선 조치를 시행하고 또 시장 상황에 대한 모니터링도 강화합니다. 국내 유통 물량을 늘리기 위해서 자가 검사 키트 생산 업체의 수출 물량에 대해서 사전 승인을 받도록 하고 또 필요시 긴급 생산 명령을 내리는 등 다각적인 수단도 강구할 예정입니다. With Korea's COVID-19 case count soaring and with it the demand for home test kits. The government's timely intervention may be key to ensure that those looking to buy a test kit will not be turned away empty-handed.
Is it or is it not the start of an endemic phase of COVID-19? Now, this is the question with regard to Omicron. And while answers may differ, the consensus is that a fresh path needs to be charted amid the global fatigue of a pandemic-related restrictions. For more, I have Professor David Kwak from Sunchang University. Welcome back, Professor Kwak. Good afternoon. I also have Dr. Kim Sung Tech at the Institute Pasture Korea live on the line. Hello, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. And joining this session virtually is Professor Monica Gandhi at the University of California, San Francisco. Professor Gandhi, it's a pleasure to speak with you again. Thank you. Professor Kwak, Korea's daily tally has been posting record highs. And for the first time in about a fortnight, the country's critical cases has risen to above 300. What is your assessment of our current COVID-19 situation? Well, I think we're uh, closely following what other countries have gone through uh, when they went through the, the wave of uh, Omicron in their own countries, such as the US or even Japan, or even Israel for that matter. When we uh, rolled back a, a week ago, uh, we had this similar uh, conversation uh, assessing why Israel is going up very high and steeply in their uh, caseloads of ICU bed units. I think we're also very likely to see that happen in our country as well. It usually follows about two weeks after the peak of um, the, the wave itself that the ICU bed capacity starts to be filled up. Um, so in about a week or so, or maybe starting this week, we are very likely to see the number of patients who become very severely ill uh, to fill up in the ICU bed units and whatnot. And hopefully we'll be able to manage within our capacity. But uh, it is also a great time that we need to really prep ourselves for an incoming patient who needs to be contained in an ICU uh, unit. Right, and while Korea has yet to see its peak, uh, Professor Gandhi, over in the US, I understand the country has hit its peak. Do you agree, Professor Gandhi? Yes, I mean, essentially about two weeks ago, the cases started coming down after hitting their peak. Hospitalizations followed about a week later. Our death rate is also starting to decrease, so everything is going in the right direction, which is leading many states in our country to ease restrictions at this point in the pandemic, hoping that this signals that endemic phase, as you spoke about at the beginning. Right. And Dr. Kim, when do you suppose will Korea witness, hopefully, a similar scenario? Well, I think the, uh, the basically I have to say the uh, the prediction is really difficult. Even when just uh, some uh, expert in the, some prediction, I mean the institute or department said that even just the predicting just the, just two weeks later is very very difficult because uh, there are many variables, including well the human behavior and also a very different immune status. Whether it is due to by the uh, the vaccination and then the, uh, the by natural infection. Earlier in the pandemic, the, the prediction is uh, really just, uh, just relatively easier because uh, no one was actually immune to the, uh, this virus. But uh, now just the uh, immune status is very different. The, and even for the vaccination, the people got uh, so several different kind of just uh, the vaccine. So that actually efficacy and the protection a level is quite just different. So basically I have to say this prediction is very just difficult. But then the, the, what I have to, what I can say is that uh, uh, as the, Dr. Kwok said, uh, we will actually follow the very similar just the trend of just the infection, uh, just the, well, the, the, that was actually shown in the U.S. and other just the European countries. And then the, their, uh, those countries actually experienced a very sharp peak of uh, just, ex, uh, just uh, infection and very is uh, actually very explosive infection and then transmission. But however, uh, in the case of Korea, we might just experience very a little bit just a different uh, scenario because, uh, well, paradoxically, we are actually have a very good the quarantine the system so if you, i just uh, assume maybe just uh, theoretically a similar number of just infections you might have just uh, some broader just a uh, distribution of just the infection cases which means that we might just a little bit just uh, delayed just the peak and then will be just a longer lasting just the peak in in our country right and staying with that professor Kwok, what are your thoughts with regard to omicron's projected peak here on the local front well uh just about a couple of weeks ago when we had a short conversation with uh, the head of uh, international health matrix and evaluation uh in the u.s he uh made the correct uh, prediction for the peak to happen in the u.s at the right time he made the prediction that in korea we would face our peak in and on either February 14th or 16th or so, which is about now to the next couple of days. I believe uh, when I noticed that there was actually a platoon being drawn on the graph 
over the latter part of the uh, half of the last week or so. And I believe uh, that might actually might be due to what uh, Dr. Kim Sung Tech has just mentioned that our um, immune status within the population is quite different from either in the US or for any other countries for that matter. But also at the same time, because we have gone through uh, the Lunar New Year holiday weekend, uh, there were much a uh, greater chance for us to mingle up then and be exposed to the infection. I think that might have brought the, the peak or the timing of the peak a little forward. And we might have had gone through the peak hopefully in the past couple of days or so, uh, peaking at around 56,000 to 58,000. So I'm hoping that we have gone through the peak already and I'm hoping that it'll, from today and on, we'll see the drastic drop in the numbers as we have gone up uh, in, the, in the same fashion. But um, it, it, there is also possibly, as Dr. Kim already mentioned, that it, we may see a slight delay in the progression towards the peak as well as dropping from it uh, due to the differences in the, um, uh, the, the immunity rate. So we, ha we would have to wait and see. Right. Professor Gandhi, as you mentioned, in line with the decline in daily caseloads over in the US, a number of states that are moving to drop restrictions, including mask mandates. Now, what are your thoughts on the timing of this decision? You know, you mentioned at the beginning of the program pandemic fatigue. And what that really means is that it has been a long two years. And I think that what people and most experts are coming to the conclusion is we cannot eradicate COVID-19. It is not our fault. It's not humans' fault. It has to do with aspects of the virus, the fact that it has animal reservoirs, that it has a long infectious period, that it looks like symptoms of other respiratory infections. And finally, our immunity, though very good against severe disease, as we've seen in enduring variants and different variants, where they're less likely, the vaccine's less likely to provide sterilizing immunity, which means that we can transmit. All of that put together means it's very difficult to eradicate the virus. And at some point we decide when we feel the virus is under control with vaccines, highly effective down to the age of five, therapeutics, which are monoclonal antibodies, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, two oral antivirals, and let the public go back to a relatively normal state. And I think that's what you're seeing reflected in the dropping of mass mandates in the United States across multiple states it has nothing to do with partisanship. It's both Republican and Democratic states that are dropping their mass mandates for indoor spaces for the public. Doesn't mean that many people won't mask, doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay attention to ventilation, but I think it's also reflecting a reality two years in. Right, and staying with that, Professor Gandhi, the move to lift mask mandates comes in spite of the CDC's recommendation for face masks within indoor settings. Does this lack of consistency, so to speak, look to affect the country's containment campaign? Well, it is very awkward what's going on in the United States right now. You're absolutely right because we have a, a Democrat-controlled presidency and the CDC is not approving lifting of um, face masks. And the states, which are mostly Democrat this last Monday, a week ago, dropped it, dropped their mask mandate. So there's a complete disconnect about what's happening. Now, on the other hand, the CDC has indicated they may change their guidance to not look at caseloads, but actually look at severe disease and vaccination rates, hospitalization and vaccination rates as their metrics for lifting mask mandates. If they do that, we can become an alignment in the states and the federal government. Right now, we're not in alignment. The State of the Union address here from President Biden is on March 1st, and we're all wondering what's happening with this, uh, this you know, um, incongruity. Right. Here in the country, Dr. Kim, local health officials themselves have also hinted at the possibility of an ease in COVID-19 restrictions despite surging caseloads in the country. How do you explain this shift in stance, Dr. Kim? Well, I think the, uh, the first of the, uh, the, there are a couple of reasons, I think, uh, but uh, the first one is probably just the Omicron variant. The Omicron variant, although the, this virus is very contagious, but it seems to just cause very mild disease uh, just compared to the uh, some uh, previous the variants. So that's probably number one reason. And then the second reason is probably just uh, the vaccination rate. And uh, in Korea, uh, well, the Korean people now, we have uh, attained more than uh, 85% 80, of uh, just uh, 
just complete just the vaccine. I mean, in this case, a two shot, just a, uh, the vaccination. So this is just pretty high. So then maybe we might be just a little bit just confident on the uh, some preventing the severe just uh, cases. And then we are also just uh, the, probably just monitoring some examples of uh, other just uh, foreign countries, including some European countries and potentially some U.S. And uh, but now just uh, today, the, uh, the the government authority just uh, just uh, uh, announced that uh, now we are seeing just a little bit just the increase of uh, severe cases of COVID-19. And then just uh, uh, considering the uh, some uh, just uh, this time, I think uh, this a uh, little bit just increase maybe just reflect the uh, the surging of the Omicron variant. Just the Omicron now, well, we know that it, is, it causes a less, just a less severe disease. But if the number of just the infections so high, then the chances are we are seeing more just a severe uh, COVID-19 patient. So I think just before deciding the, whether we just ease the, uh, the current uh, social restriction guidelines, maybe we'll just government just uh, we'll just uh, just very uh, cautiously just uh, monitor the current status and then uh, decide whether to uh, whether to just pursue just uh, some easing or like uh, just maintaining just the current social distancing just the guidelines right and while we wait for the government to make its decision professor clark what are your recommendations with regard to our future framework of prevention guidelines i think we have to stratify um the the implementation of the restriction uh within our population because by now we all know that the the infection itself really affects people differently according to their um, immune status as well as especially their ages. Um, I um, strongly agree with the general direction of the what's government's taking and its path that they are trying their best to protect more vulnerable people now that they want to give PCR tests to only those people who are above 60 years of age. Uh, they're strongly encouraging uh, for those people to get booster shots and whatnot. Uh, so uh, in that direction, in that regard, I think maybe, um, and I'm saying this partly because there are also accumulating evidences that uh, the natural immunity caused uh, by infection tends to cause much longer lasting immunity as well as stronger uh, immunity once uh, it's if it's given after the vaccination. So I think we need to think hard uh, to, and to come up with a way to protect those who are very vulnerable, such as those who are elderly, but not only limited to them, because we, it's also known that for even younger generations who tend to be obese, who people with, um, let's say, diabetes, uh, severe underlying conditions also tend to be vulnerable. So we need to protect them. But at the same time, if we could give somehow in a very safest manner, uh, the younger generation who are less vulnerable, who will likely to go through the infection if they are boosted uh, with, a, uh, with a shot, very mildly uh, or possibly without any symptoms to possibly go around be exposed to nat and uh, obtaining natural immunity uh, i think that'll actually create better chances for the country as a whole to gain some of a, a fighting level of immunity against any future um, uh, uh, variants or even SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, when there has to be another wave to come into the country. So uh, what I'm basically trying to say is stratification in its implementation of social distancing uh, should be taken and uh, special atten attendance uh, or care should be taken towards those people definitely more vulnerable to the disease, especially for those elderly and for those, uh, let's say, either obese in their BMI level, but also, uh, and, and, I, and, and I always make this comment at, at the end of the whole conversation, but let's not forget there are also children who may be vulnerable to disease, yet still not allowed in our country to receive any vaccines because vaccinations for uh, people between years, uh, ages of 5 to 11 have not been allowed to receive any vaccines in the country. They need to be allowed. I, I'm not saying they should be mandated to receive that, but for those who choose to receive vaccinations, still should be given the choice to receive them. So I think uh, we should not forget about those people who still want to go ahead and get the vaccines. We should encourage them, all, everyone, to receive them, but also at the same time focus mainly uh, protecting those who are vulnerable to disease as well. Right, and staying with vaccination, Dr. Kim, authorities on this Monday also announced their plans for a second booster dose for those in the high-risk category. What are your thoughts on the efficacy of this latest prevention measure here? Well, I think uh, those uh, the recommendation guidelines are also just uh, uh, 
actually just uh, made in the, uh, the the U.S. CDC just the last month, and then that's only for the, the people with uh, some immunocompromised condition. And I think uh, those that people actually do not just elicit very just uh, strong or just a very enough just uh, immune just a reaction c compared to uh, some uh, some general public, some healthy people. So it might be just uh, just uh, just helpful for those uh, the, that the group of people. But for the, some general public, the uh, this uh, second uh, the booster shot is not really just considered yet, and then there's no just enough just uh, scientific evidence which actually supports the, uh, the the second shot of just the vaccination. And I think uh, as of now the uh, once we just finish the, uh, the well, actually first shot, now we, we regard this as uh, just the primary just the shot series. Then the, with this shot, the, our just protection is uh, pretty good. I mean, especially for, especially uh, not just for the antibody response, but for the, some uh, cellular immunity, which is uh, actually just uh, made by the T cell response, is pretty just good and robust and then very long lasting. Right. Professor Gandhi, Dr. Kim mentioned the CDC and talking about that entity. It claimed COVID-19 booster protection wanes after four months. Could you tell us a bit more about this finding? Yes, I think it's important to stress what Dr. Kim just said, that when we say immunity waning, we should keep in mind that it's one aspect of immunity waning. You're right that the booster shot after about four months in the CDC published on Friday, does uh, the booster shot, the antibodies from the booster shot go down? Same finding in the UK after about 10 weeks. But that's only one arm of the immune system. Antibodies go down. But your T cells, which Dr. Kim just mentioned, protect you against severe disease, and they seem to be long lasting. And B cells are the recipe book to make more antibodies if needed in the future, aided by T cells, and they will make more antibodies if needed in the future. So the protection against severe disease in that large CDC study was maintained. So it's severe disease versus more mild infection. Antibodies will protect you against more mild infection, but you get the, if you keep on boosting, you'll get those antibodies, but we're unlikely to boost except for vulnerable people. Uh, people continuously just to keep our antibodies up. That isn't usually a strategy in infectious disease. So likely only the immunocompromised or very older patients with multiple comorbidities will get a fourth boost. And that is the right thing to do going to what um, we're talking about here, trying to protect the vulnerable in a population, but allowing younger people, especially who are vaccinated, to have more of normal life. Right. Professor Quark, Novavax is now being offered to adults here in the country. And beyond them, what can you tell us about its safety for expecting mothers? Well, um, so I dug a, uh, in, a little bit into the, the, the general um, basics of uh, well, how Novavax came about. So the biggest advantage of Novavax is that its, uh, its method has also been uh, applied in other original types of vaccines that we used to receive before. So this uh, method was actually implemented in an in influenza vaccine, for example. But uh, unfortunately, there has not been a great amount of evidence that accumulated uh, in COVID-19 Novavax vaccines in pregnant mothers. But it is, I think, scientifically deducible that because it worked very safely with all other uh, clinical trials and, and its participants, I think it'll be safe to use in pregnant mothers. Just yet, there is no clear scientific evidence that proves it. So, but in the near future, because the method has already been used widely in other types of vaccines, I think we'll be able to see COVID-19 Novavax vaccine being used uh, in pregnant mothers or even in children for that matter without any uh, concerns for the safety. Right, and in children, we're talking about those aged between 5 and 11 then. Yes. Right. Dr. Kim, what are your thoughts on the recent government action here in the country to address disruptions in the distribution of COVID-19 self-test kits? Well, I think, uh, the, well, just recently we actually experienced uh, some shortage of the self-test kits in uh, just a local pharmacy or some convenience stores. And then I think uh, this uh, situation actually reminds me of the, uh, the so, sort of just shortage of the mask, but in the early of just the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the end, uh, we actually just, uh, just uh, well, just increased up the, our capacity to just uh, the manufacturing to those masks. But I think uh, compared to such a mask, uh, the cases, I think uh, in for the, the self-test case, we are in a better, some better uh, situation. And then some of just the companies, the, the diagnostic, just a kit, the developing company, they were actually just a well advanced just a, 
in terms of just preparation of just uh, these uh, the self-test kits. And uh, well, just fortunately now just the government, the government authorities actually approved just a couple more just uh, self-test kits from domestic just uh, the companies. So and uh, this will somehow just alleviate the uh, some current situation. And then it'll, and in the end, we will have just uh, enough just uh, amount of uh, self-test kits in uh, especially in just in Korea. Right. And speaking of rapid antigen test kits, Professor Gandhi, what can you share with us about the Biden administration's rather ambitious, ambitious plan, that is, to distribute these self-test kits to Americans free of charge? I understand the government is buying one billion test kits. Yes. So each household was supposed to be able to get four test kits. And I have to say, uh, you know, we've already peaked and and a lot of these test kits just simply didn't arrive in time to help us through the Omicron surge. The same with N95 masks that were distributed by the government. It just went so fast. It went up and then it came down fast, like we were speaking about before. And uh, some many of these test kits haven't come. So it was a great plan to send them out to people for test kits per person, but uh, it wasn't working out as well as they'd hoped. Right. Meanwhile, back here in the country, Professor Kwok, members of the public are being granted greater autonomy with regard to testing, tracing, and even treatment efforts. What are your words of advice given this reality here? Well, the springtime is coming. Um, the weather-wise, but also uh, COVID-19 pandemic-wise, I hope. Uh, so I think it would be a great chance for us to actually take, as a primary care physician, that is, take everything outside, do some exercise, uh, start enjoying the weather, uh, especially for those who are healthy, uh, but also for those people who might be more vulnerable to disease, let's still keep the common senses and keep washing our hands, keep wearing the mask as uh, uh, it is uh, socially guidelines right now. But I think it'll be a great chance for once, the, once this wave is over, I think it, it, the springtime will come and it'll be for us to enjoy that moment. Right, and hopefully you are right. All right, Professor Kwok, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. Thank Dr. You. Kim, thank you for being with us today. And Professor Gandhi over in the US, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right, and that is all the time we have for now. Do join us again same time tomorrow, that is Tuesday. Thank you for watching.